Thank you. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to our celebration of 100 years of women's suffrage sponsored by the Women's Legal Forum and the American Constitution Society. My name is Christine Venter and I have the good fortune to be the faculty advisor to the Women's Legal Forum. Um, and Dean Cole is unfortunately out of town, so he's not celebrating with us today. But that means that I have the pleasure of welcoming you um, and introducing our distinguished panel and moderator to you. Uh, before I get to that, though, I'd like to take a moment to briefly reflect on what the suffragettes would think of our celebration today. Um, as many of you know, the movement for women's rights basically started officially at least um, in 1848 when Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton hosted the Women's Convention at Seneca Falls. And they were joined by women like Susan B. Anthony, Carrie Chapman Catt, and other activists. All of those women were mocked in the press for demanding the right of women to vote, but they persisted and they remained optimistic that women's suffrage would happen, even though Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott both died before getting, women, getting to see women voting. Their activism was taken up by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, who not only continued their work, but after the 19th, sorry, after the 19th Amendment passed, almost immediately began to work on the Equal Rights Amendment. So what does that tell us about these remarkable women? They were optimistic, they were determined, they took on new challenges, and they mentored a new generation of women to take their place when the time came. And that's some of the characteristics that are shared by our distinguished panel today. So fast forward to a different world um, in many respects today. And since 1980, more women than men have voted in general elections. Um, on January the 14th, 2020, so almost two weeks ago, Virginia became the 38th state in the nation to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And so there are many reasons that the suffragettes would be celebrating were they here today. Another reason that they would celebrate is the accomplishment of all these distinguished women that we have on our panel today. Um, Chief Justice Loretta Rush graduated from Purdue University and IU Mara School of Law. And she was a partner in a law firm and a superior court judge before becoming the first woman to be appointed as Chief Justice in Indiana. Judge Amy Barrett, um, as, who many of you know, graduated first in her class from Notre Dame Law School, clerked for a Court of Appeals judge before clerking for Justice Antonin Scalia of the Supreme Court. She then became a professor at Notre Dame before being confirmed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Beth Tavitas, on my left here, is a double judge who was a prosecutor in private practice and a Superior Court judge before being appointed to the Indiana Court of Appeals in 2018. And finally, our moderator, Liz Hurley, my colleague from the Legal Aid Clinic, who graduated from Notre Dame Law School, was a prosecutor for several years before being appointed as a magistrate on the circuit court and then to her current position as a Superior Court judge in St. Joseph County. And one other remarkable thing that I'd like to say about these women is between them, they have 18 children. Okay. <laughs> um, so I've listed only a fraction of their many accomplishments, but I wanted you to spend time with them today rather than have me talk about them. So um, Liz is going to moderate our discussion and then she's going to invite questions um, from the audience. So save your questions up and thank you and welcome. All right. All right, well, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. I can't, I'm, for me, it's such an honor to be here with these amazing women and to sit in the same, in the same row as them and be allowed to moderate such a distinguished panel. Uh, and I want to thank Allison from the uh, American Constitutional Society and Rachel from the Women's Legal Forum for putting together a series of questions for everybody. Uh, uh, to really uh, help in this discussion, engage in good discussion, and then obviously open for questions afterwards. Uh, so uh, I'll start with you, um, Judge Barrett, uh, Amy. <laughs> uh, I will say this right from the start, I'm probably going to stumble a little on everyone's first name. Justice Rush told me that I needed to call her by her first name today, Loretta. Uh, this is difficult for me. I've never <laughs> been able to do it before now. 
Uh, she's always been just as fresh, sort of my role model. And uh, as I tell people all the time, the person I want to be when I grow up. Um, <laughs> and so uh, if I stumble over first names, it's only because out of respect, I've never really felt comfortable doing that before. Uh, but I'll start with Amy. Uh, first question uh, that was posed is, uh, if you could share an experience that you've had, and, and all of you uh, following Amy, uh, where you have been the only woman in the room. I mean, women have broken a lot of glass ceilings, but you know, we're still working on things. So tell us, uh, tell us about an experience that you've had where you've been, where you've been it. It was funny, we were all shown the questions ahead of time so that we could think about them. And this question kind of made me laugh because when I think back about my professional life, apart from teaching, where there are lots of women in the room when I teach, um, I was almost always the only woman in the room. Um, you know, I, when I clerked, I clerked for two male judges and my co-clerks were all men. And then I practiced in DC and I did sometimes work with women, but more often both the clients and the lawyers with whom I worked were men. And then even when I joined the faculty, while I had female colleagues on the faculty at the law school, I wasn't, it was very frequent that, you know, I would be serving on a committee or I would be at conferences at other law schools, be out to dinner when I was giving a talk someplace else and it would be me and several men. Um, so it was actually quite fun. Um, now on the Seventh Circuit where I sit, we have 11 active judges and there are six men and five women. And just this, I guess it was a year ago, um, we had an all women panel, which was great, quite fun. Um, I have to say, in a, in a, to give credit where credit is due, the men that I worked with, I never felt undervalued. I think I was very fortunate from the very start of my career that I never felt belittled or undervalued because I was a woman. Um, so professionally, I had that good fortune, although I did not always have that experience. I had some horrifying experiences with opposing counsel. Um, actually, students, um, when I was a, a new faculty member. But the men with whom I worked were always quite respectful. I don't know if the rest of you have found this. When it's harder to be the only woman in the room, I find is not the professional situation, but it's more the social situation. Like, I can't count the number of times I've had to walk into a work event and be the only woman in the room. And that's more awkward. I've often thought, what would it feel like to walk into this event and feel very comfortable because I was with women and we could talk about, you know, something besides sports, for example. <laughs> With golf. <laughs> golf. Yes. golf, yes. I graduated, I was in law school in 1980, and you've got to think there hadn't been a woman on the US Supreme Court yet. And my class was, it was a small, maybe a little under 20% women. Um, I was an associate, the only woman associate in my law firm. Then I was the only woman partner in my law firm. And then when I was elected as judge, I was the only woman judge. Um, and then when I, in 2012, Indiana was one of two states in the country that didn't have a woman on their Supreme Court, and we all got mad. So we all applied. And there's eight, um, you know, the 22 applicants, I think like 17 were women and five men. You know, my mom was, you know, staying with me, and she goes, well, What are you doing? You know, you're never going to get this. And I said, Well, you know, maybe we can push somebody else on. So finally, the, you, you, you make the the interview and then it's 10 and then it's three and all of a sudden I found myself as the only woman again in the top three. So I had a, I met Governor Daniels at that time and I had met him before. It was at the live it was at live exchange and they said, well he doesn't like it when you ask him questions. I said, well I got a lot of questions. So <laughs> we you know I asked him if he was going to move to Purdue because he was getting he was looking at that position then. So I was very happy to get it. And then about a year or so when I was on the court, um, the position of chief justice came and I was the newest judge or newest justice. Do I apply? Do I not? I didn't really feel like I had my land legs with being a justice and coming from having practiced law for 16 years and being a trial court judge for 13, but I did. And part of what I did was what am I saying to women if this opportunity comes up? Um, so I was, I was appointed, I went through an interview and I was appointed um, chief justice 
and I was just asked to do it a second time. So I'm now Chief Justice for another five years. So I'm still the only woman on my court. Um, Myra Selby was the first woman, and she was on the court for about four years back in the 90s. So when you go into the Indiana Supreme Court, have any of you been there? You gotta get down there now. Okay, good. What do you notice when you're in there? There's pictures on the wall. Um, 108 men, <laughs> and so when fourth graders are in there, I go, what do you notice, what do you think? You feel the sense of history being in the courtroom, and they go, wow, there's a lot of mad men <laughs> <laughs> on that. So, and I agree with Amy, I mean, I, you know, I was, I remember a clerk uh, for a large law firm down in Houston, and another large law firm in Indianapolis, um, and the social is, was awkward. You know, they'd come in and say, who wants to go golfing this weekend? You know, well, I'm one of, I have four, if you're dividing up who is going to be kids, I've got four kids. So golf was never something I was able to do, even though my main name was Hosey and they were all golfers. But um, it, it is sometimes, you, you miss that. So now, with women judges in Indiana, probably about five years ago, maybe 18% of the judges in Indiana were women. Well, now we're at 30%. Uh, Governor Holcomb has made a real point on selecting um, women, and I think almost half his appointments are women. So we have to keep pushing, and we we have to keep pushing. And I, I invite, invite women law students and lawyers to my home. I reach out to them. I say, you can do this. Because sometimes as women, you need to you need to tap you on the shoulder and say, I see something in you maybe you don't see in yourself. I have had a lot of those taps in my life. So I hope that people will take the risk um, and apply. You know, in Indiana, we've not had a woman governor. Um, we've not had a woman president yet. I mean, we still have a ways to go. And, you know, 100 years isn't that long. Well, for you, I was born in the 50s. Uh, maybe it seems long for a lot of you, but, you know, we haven't had, you know, we've, now we have the vote. We really need to make sure that we do something with the vote. And then that as you, as you are lawyers and as you succeed, make sure that you reach behind um, you as well, because I think it's really important. How about you, Judge Tweed? So I often found myself, um, mostly when I did criminal defense work in federal court, and I, one case that I had lasted two months, and there were six to nine men that were on the different defendants. We were representing them, and I was um, nine months pregnant <laughs> during a pregnancy, a difficult pregnancy. So. Um, I was treated well. Um, I think I'm going to say Judge Barrett, as she was treated well, and I, and the men that have tapped me, or the people that have tapped me on the shoulder, have happened to be men. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to let's go back to Justice Rush's Loretta. <laughs> <laughs> we were friends for ten years before I was a justice, and then now it's yeah. Just I'm going to say my story about that too. So, um, <laughs> But yes, if women have a tendency to wait until somebody taps them on the shoulder, and that for every every position where I started out as a referee, and um, the judge that I worked for at the at the time I was a public defender in her court, you know, tapped me on the shoulder and said, I, I, you know, would you like to have this position? And then I happened to meet a former governor from a different state, um, just by happenstance, and he said you know, you really should apply um, to be a trial court judge. I was still a referee. And I, I needed a, a former governor to tap me on the shoulder and to, to show that he had confidence in me. And when I was an undergrad here, I had a professor at undergrad that I ran into on campus that said, hey, have you ever thought about going to law school? I see something in you that, um, you know, I think you would do well. So, that is how that is how I progressed in my career, which when I look back at that is pretty sad. Um, and I try to mentor students as well. I'm here on the NDLA board. Part of our, our goal is to mentor students and I love to do that. I also teach and I'm able to mentor my students that way. But I think that it's just really important for you to, to believe as women um, and if you're a man in the room, to tap the shoulder of a woman. Um, but I hope that that changes. And I, what I want to say is that I, when I felt that 
what it felt like to be the only woman. Um, I'm going to change that. I always felt that if I was a woman and I was in the room that I had gotten somewhere. Um, I too was, you know, angry when, when we didn't have a justice on our Indiana Supreme Court, a woman. And I was one of the 17 that applied. Um, and again, I didn't feel like I was deserving of that position, but I also wanted to, the call out, and this came again from a man, the call out was all of you women who have the experience, please apply to show the state of Indiana and the public that there are qualified women to choose from. And so I was delighted when my friend Loretta um, <laughs> got the position and, uh, and I remember when we were at a judicial conference and I was the speaker at the judicial conference and there was just people just screaming in the back of the courtroom, a lot of ladies screaming. And it was because the governor had announced that Loretta had been appointed as a justice. And then um, a year or so later, whenever that was, when she, I, she was up for the chief justice position and watching on my computer and they, They'll give you the, um, you know, the updates of the candidates uh, and who, who the governor was meeting with, the commission was meeting with, and when she got it, I was screaming, and my my chambers and my bailiff came running in, thinking that something was wrong because <laughs> I was screaming. <laughs> so it's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal that we we have these great women. Um, so. I had one of my uh, best memories was your very first state of the judiciary address as chief justice. And I remember being fortunate enough to attend that. And uh, whenever uh, the chief justice gives the state of the judiciary, it's in the state house and the trial judges and that, are, that attend all come in their robes and are able to sit in sort of the top seating area of the legislative uh, chamber. And what I remember was just the first, probably two or three rows filled with women, women judges. They're just in awe of this woman who is now giving the state of the judiciary. And it, it was, I had been on the bench for about a year and a half, maybe two years at that point. And it was one of the greatest moments to be with all those women up there, all in our robes, and to watch, watch you give your, this, the first state of the judiciary as chief justice. Great memory. Uh, I had the good fortune of uh, being appointed the first female circuit court magistrate here. Uh, our circuit court had never had a female judicial officer. And um, Judge Michael Gotch, who was the circuit court judge at the time, is now a federal magistrate, had appointed me. And uh, that's one of also my proudest accomplishments. And as I look here in the front row, I'm so proud to see Magistrate Crystal Briscoe who is now in that position, uh, keeping the, uh, <laughs> the women's legacy in the circuit court going strong. So it makes me so happy to see you sitting there. Uh, so now that we've talked about what it's been like for people to, for, for the three of you to be uh, the first woman in the room, how has your experience changed as more and more women have, uh, you know, joined the legal profession, joined the judiciary, and you're not the only woman in the room anymore? How do you think that's uh, enhanced your professional life? I think it's enhanced the profession generally. I think, you know, I should say you know, it's not all about me or all about any one of us. I mean, I think the profession is enhanced by having women present, women on the bench, women in the ranks of law firms, women making partner, um, women in state and federal judiciary, I mean, and on and on. So I think the profession is enhanced because there's not talent lying on the table. I mean, you know, we're pulling more and more um, women in. And I think, you know, for, um, I, I, I will say that I, I think it's not because when I was younger, I'm, I'm the oldest of seven children and it's six girls. And then my youngest uh, sibling is a boy. And my dad having all these daughters used to sing to us, anything boys can do, girls can do better. <laughs> but then when my brother was born, he started feeling bad, like he might give my brother a contract. So <laughs> he dialed that back a little bit. Um, but I, I think, it's not that I think women do the job better than men. 
um, I just think we don't want talent lying on the table. We want everyone who's qualified, women and men, um, to be in these positions. And I certainly enjoy it, not because, you know, I, I enjoy working with my male colleagues too, mm -hmm. but there's also um, a sense of ease, especially in social situations, to not feel, you know, the pressure of always being in the other, the other only woman in the room. And it's also inspiring, you know, especially because women have to balance things a little bit differently. I mean, my husband and I, we have seven children and we share in the juggling. He does a, a lot, you know, he today did the carpool runs because I was coming here. You know, we divide everything up very, um, actually kind of unequally right now. I think he's probably doing a little bit more of the, the childcare stuff. But I think women um, feel it um, in, in some ways differently than men, just the tug of responsibilities, even if they have spouses who are really kind of pulling equal weight. And so to have other women um, who are a little bit ahead of you professionally and see how they're balancing or to have other women so that you don't feel, um, you know, when something comes up and you have an emergency with a child, to know that there are other women um, with whom you're communicating about not being able to make a meeting or something like that because you have sick child, it's just um, the presence of other people who have those same demands on their time makes it more comfortable and easier, I think, to juggle those same demands. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I like going to law schools and seeing half the class, half the classes are women, um, watching more women make partnership, watching more women trial court judges in that, because I think it's important. Um, I, I remember I, I got a, and I think it's important that people, people need to see us in robes to think that they can be in that robe at some point. There was, I got a, this mother, I don't know, she had a, four, she had a fourth grader and she sent me a picture of her daughter history day this year and her daughter dressed up for history day as the Indiana Chief Justice. And I thought, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, if you don't see that, you need to see it to think that, that it can happen to you. Because again, going back to what I saw when I was growing up, it would never have been I would never have dreamed that would be a possibility. And I'm not above picking up the phone and calling people, right, Magistrate Briscoe, <laughs> and saying, you know, what are you doing? Uh, why don't you think about this? And for you, one of the things we're adding to the role of attorneys, for those of you that practice in Indiana, we're going to have this thing, do you want to serve on a committee or a commission? Are there things that are, because in addition to your practice, there's a lot of things that just may be your passion. Um, Beth is, she did a lot of um, really innovative ideas in the family law arena up in Lake County, and one of the reasons that the governor appointed her was because she did so much for this crisis. These families are in crisis, they come into court, it's just like, bad, you know, so much trauma and damage. So we're looking at sort of changing the way we do family law cases, and it was really nice to pick up the phone and say, Beth, will you lead this innovation initiative? And so she's got a team of people with her, um, probably women and men, you get a lot of women on that um, committee, but it, it's fun to appoint them on things. So in addition to your work, you're going to have some things with, with your law license. I mean, you've got the ability to represent people and to advance rights. I mean, one of my favorite Indiana Supreme Court cases, we were not, we were messing around in the early days, like land squatters and stealing horses and playing card games. And we finally got a case in 1820. Um, and it was a young um, slave gal from southern Indiana named Polly Strong. And she had read the Indiana. She learned how to read because she worked at a bar, and the bar patrons told her how to read. And she read, and her mother learned, knew how to, Jenny knew how to read, and she saw the Indiana Constitution said slavery was illegal. And when we became a state, we, we got this right. We said slavery was illegal. So she got some attorneys to represent her. She lost at the trial court. She brought the case up to the Indiana Supreme Court. Um, so you can have this parcel of rights, right? But sometimes you need an attorney to, to help you get those rights. And that's the license that you're gonna have. And look at the rights that you can advance with that. And she won her case. She won her case. And we, when one of my colleagues retired from the Indiana Supreme Court, I wanted to have his last oral argument in the original Supreme Court room down in Corden. And we also did a historic marker for Polly Strong that day. And on the back of the marker was Mary Clark, because Mary Clark, the next year, they also, she, she fought to get her rights because they called her an indentured servitude, which was another name for slavery. And she won her case, and her like, great, great, great granddaughter was with us when we did that. But it just shows the power of what you have and the rights that you're going to be able to advance and the causes that you're going to be able to advance. 
and in addition to your practice, there's all kinds of other things that you can volunteer your time on um, to change because we need to change. The legal profession five years from now, 10 years from now, it's gonna look different. And we all need to be part of that change. We're looking at online dispute resolution. I just went to a seminar in China. They have robotic judges. Can you imagine? It's a woman too. The, word, the judge is a woman. Um, so so there's, there's just lots of opportunities, but it's really fun to see women and their passions um, and their ability to go forward. I probably wouldn't be a judge if I didn't volunteer for our women's shelter. I, you know, victims of domestic violence. I represented them for free to help them get protective orders. And then I also started looking at children that were um, caught up in the system. And I volunteered a lot. I was a CASA to about 100 kids, even though I was a civil litigator. But it was that work that got people to come to me and say, why don't you consider running for judge? Not my stellar jury performance <laughs> um, on a regular basis. So women, we get things done. <laughs> it's just true. It, men get things done too, but just when you have women as part of looking at a problem and sitting down and we're very task oriented, especially when there's 18 children between us, we don't have time to mess around. So my experience has been that, um, and I have to say with the Chief Justice, she has a lot of the same passions that I do. And is it because she's a woman? I don't know, um, but I'm thankful for that. I mean, families and children and access to justice are my passions and women, bringing women up and, and letting them rise up. And those are my passions. And so they're getting done. And I'm seeing projects that I've worked on for years and years and years um, are now coming to fruition because there's more women at the table working on these issues. Um, and, and you can hear you know, passion. I mean, sometimes we're allowed to be passionate. <laughs> um, I guess men can be passionate too, but our passion, um, it's just nice to have both voices, to have the male voice and the woman's voice, because we do look at things sometimes differently. And what's, what we're passionate about as women might be different than what men are passionate about. Um, and being able to talk about your children and talking about the challenges of being a working woman and um, support. I, I think that's a, a big thing. I have a lot of women friends that we support each other. I have male friends that are supportive as well, but to have both that you have in common, um, things that you have in common with when you're talking about the issues that we face, um, I faced the issue of wanting to work part-time partway through my career because I had three children at home and I'm a slacker compared to these ladies, but um, I wanted to stay home. I didn't like to cook and I didn't like to clean, but I loved to be with my children and I loved going to their school and volunteering to teach music appreciation and art appreciation as a volunteer. and baking castle cakes for some, you know, castle king's royalty day. I wanted to do that. And I talked to a woman who was older than I was. And she said, you know, Beth, you can have your cake and eat it too. But if it doesn't make you happy, you have to decide what's best for you. And for me, that was working part time. And I I recall a lawyer, I'll never forget this, I was at the women's state prison um, doing a PCR case for the prosecutor's office and the male attorney um, was there and it was, one, it was one of my last cases that I did before I left the prosecutor's office and I was telling him how I was going to go part time. And he looked at me and he said, oh Beth, you're gonna regret that. You're never gonna be able to find your way back into the legal field. And luckily I didn't listen to that. And when anybody tells me I can't do something, <laughs> um, I will do just the opposite. So, um, you know, sometimes the negative voices, um, you know, women have positive voices for you because they can understand what you're going through as a woman. And so that's why it's so wonderful that 50%, and I think at Notre Dame, is it 51%? Um, of the students are females, which um, 
does a lot. To, there's a lot to offer. Women have a lot to offer. Men have a lot to offer. It's no longer um, a field that is not designed just for men. Not that it ever was designed just for men. It just was harder for women um, to get where we are. So. One of the things before we came out here, when you and I were talking in the back room that uh, really stood out to me was your discussion about uh, you know, the work you had done as a trial court judge in, in family law, but now as an appellate court judge and being on this committee that Loretta was talking about, being really able to put into, you know, statewide or, you know, on a much larger scale, these, uh, uh, these innovative ideas you had for family law cases. And, and so that how hard you worked in your career, you know, gets you now to this point where you're benefiting not just Lake County, but our entire state with your hard work. And so I, I thought that was really amazing when we were talking beforehand. So we've had these discussions about, um, you know, being the first woman in the room now, welcoming many women into the room. Uh, but we all know that there's still work to be done uh, in the areas of race and gender on the bench. And so why is it important? Why do you see that, uh, what do you see the importance of diversity on the bench to be? Well, like I alluded to before, I mean, I think men and women are equally capable of doing the job. So it's not that I think a woman would necessarily have a different perspective on a case mm -hmm. than a man. I often see cases eye to eye with, you know, if I have a mixed panel with another woman and a man, we'll often all see cases the same way. But it's very important for all the reasons that we've been saying, you know, that women are welcomed into the profession. Um, I think it's very important for young women to see that there aren't paths that are um, blocked for them. Mm -hmm. It's important for law students, but then even kind of going back farther than that, it's important for college students, high school students, and for this, was it a fourth, sixth, grader. fourth grader who dresses up like Chief Justice Rush for Halloween? Um, <laughs> I think that we want women to see that all these paths are open. And to my mind, when we think about how to get that done. I mean, not that we're gonna solve all the world's problems in the next you know, five minutes of the <laughs> panel. But in thinking about how to get that done for women, I actually think that right now, the primary work to be done for women is in childcare and figuring out ways for law firms and especially if women are doing public service, if they're working for public interest groups or prosecutors or the federal public defender or state you know, defense, you know, then salaries are lower than they are if you're at a large law firm and childcare is expensive. So I think when I think about challenges for women and how to help women in the profession, I think quality childcare is the thing that comes, you know, most, you know, that, that leaps out as the thing that has to be addressed because it is, it's, it's just difficult. And I think we have to make it easy for women to go part-time and find their way back into the profession. Um, I think that is, that's a myth and, but I, let's see, I think it's a myth for some people, but then I think that it can be hard for others. My sister is also a lawyer. She lives in Charleston, South Carolina, and she decided to get off the partnership track and go of counsel. Um, she, that alleviated some of her pressure, but she doesn't want to go part-time because one of the things about part-time um, is she has a fear that it just means less pay for the same number of hours mm -hmm. because you <laughs> often true. just kind of get, you know, your clients aren't going to say, oh, I'm sorry, you're, real, you're only at, you know, 35 hours a week. Okay, well then forget this call. <laughs> Don't respond to my email. Um, so anyway, I think we have to find ways to make it possible um, for women. Loretta, how about you? What diversity on the bench? Why is yeah. that important? Well, there's all kinds of diversity too. And sure. um, right now, I think we're really lagging with regard to um, people in the profession of color. And we need more of color. I look at disproportionate minority contact uh, with the system. I look at you know the trust of people believing our system that they're gonna get a fair shake. Uh, you know, implicit bias, equity inclusion, I mean, we, we've got to train our judges on this. We have to train our law enforcement on this, whether it's family welfare cases or criminal cases, why do we have so many um, uh, individuals of color in that? So in Indiana, we have about 18,700 18, some attorneys. 
and you can check the box and you don't have to check with regard to um, race, uh, but a lot of people do. I think 17% don't, but we only have like 1,400 of color. And that's not enough. Out of 18,000? Out of 18,000. Oh. Realizing some didn't check it. But, you know, we've had 600 iCleos, and um, the iCleo program is a program where we really want to look at traditionally underrepresented um, individuals in the profession and have the scholars. So we've had 600 graduate through that. Were you, did you do iCleo, Crystal? Um, and, we, and I think that's important. So it's, you know, women, we've got half the law schools are women. Let's start looking around for a, a, like a wider net. And we do, part of what's a little bit different with the state courts is when you are when you're, have a branch of government in charge of, you kind of set all the educational programming. So we require educational programming on implicit bias. And we had a full day um, program two years ago, maybe it was, um, on looking at equity inclusion and implicit bias. And I had all judges of color present. And it was really eye-opening. Um, did you go? Judge Bro, you weren't even a judge yet then, were you? Two years ago? Okay, he's really new. Um, but it was really eye-opening to hear their stories and say, you know, what it feels like. What it feels like to be a judge in a Southern Indiana community and pulled over for, for your taillight not being on and then having a drug sweep done in your car and then explaining that to your son because you're a judge of color. Or being talked down to if you're a judge. Um, so I think that we have a lot to do with regard to diversity access and trust and I practiced law for 16 years and you'd stand outside the courtroom with your client and your client wonders, well, who does the, who does the judge know? Is our system fair? Um, and I think to have a fair system, we need to have, make sure that our judiciary and our profession mirrors our population so we can start working on some of those um, issues. And I mean, I'll have judges will tell me, listen, I am, there's no bias, I'm biased going in my body. Well, we start collecting stats really with regard to looking at different decision points and looking at how many kids are getting a diversion, how many of the subject, sub, subjective crimes, such as um, resisting arrest or disorderly conduct based on the population you have in your community. In my community in Tippecanoe County, I thought, you know, we're doing a good job. I'm aware of this. So I started looking and I started collecting the data well, less than 10% of our community was community of color, but 60 plus percent of the resisting and disorderly conducts were people of color. Well, okay, let's start talking now but at all the decision points. And I think we have to have diversity on the bench and we have to realize we have to work that way, but we also have to work within our profession on implicit bias and really understand what equity inclusion is. It doesn't mean to treat everybody the same. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. I think it, I think we're I think we're behind um, in that. I think women. I think we've we've done well. We still have a way to go with regard to looking at big law and you know partnerships and general counsel positions. Um, we're making inroads, and I think we need to do the same um, with regard to traditionally underrepresented populations in our profession. I worry about that. I will say I think uh, and Judge Sweet, uh, I don't mean to. Obviously, you have a, a chance to speak, but I thought one of the things you talked about was judicial training and implicit bias, and that's one thing I've been very grateful for in the time that I've been on the bench. I think that uh, in our Indiana State conferences, that's been a real, um, a real big topic, and not just individual sessions that people can choose to go to, because we always know that the people probably who don't go to those sessions are maybe the people that need to go to those <laughs> sessions the most. And uh, not that everyone can't benefit from them, but uh, but that you've made it, a, you know, it's been a plenary session that everyone attends and we all discuss these things as, a, as an entire state judiciary. And I think that's been invaluable. Uh, uh, not, it doesn't solve all the world's problems by any means, but I think the fact that that issue is being recognized and addressed as part of our statewide conferences has uh, been a very positive thing. And so Beth, how about you? So I think diversity is just, just common sense. It's obvious that, well, number one for me, life is more interesting if people are not all like me. I, I don't want to spend all of my time working or hanging out with people who look like me, sound like me, and are like me. I like people who have different experiences, and that's why it's so important on the bench is to have different perspectives. Um, 
And something that's always hit me since I began practicing law, um, I started as a intern at the US Attorney's Office and was able to practice in the courtroom as a student and as the Indiana Supreme Court courtroom, you see all the pictures on the walls. And at that time, it was all white men. And then I started practicing and those still, still white men were all around me. And at that then, I mean, even, even those photos, if you're sensitive like I am to your surroundings, I notice things. When you see just all white, white men around you as you're practicing law, um, it just sends this subconscious me message. And then I think, well, what if you're a defendant um, in, in a courtroom and that's all you see um, and you're of, of color and that's, or you're a woman and that's all you see is white men. And so, I don't to be legitimate as a justice system. I think you have you have to do something about this diversity. And so I'm hoping that all of you. I hope I hope that anybody who feels that they're a minority will just keep on going for what, whatever it is that you want. Even if you think that door is closed, somebody has to knock on the door and knock it down. And you just have to keep doing it and feel confident that your efforts, whether you're successful for yourself, will be successful for someone else behind you. And um, I look at, when you look at politics and you look at the people, you know, that are running the politicians, I mean, a lot of them are white males. So how do women break into that? How do minorities break into that, that political system? where things are, you know, the, the movers and the shakers are making things happen for people. So try to be one of those movers and shakers, you know, try to, you know, have your voice heard. Um, I, I would love to see more diversity. It's, it's again, that's something that is important to me. Uh, I have diversity on my law clerks. Um, I sponsored a, an iCleo student this past summer. And I really enjoy being able to try to um, bring up these minority women to, to realize that they're just, they're welcome to the table and that they just need to go for it. But it's just hard to have that confidence yourself unless you have people behind you that are willing to support you. So um, be the supportive one or be the one that's trying to knock down the door. In my court, it's all felony criminal cases. That's my docket. And so uh, the criminal, this is clearly an area uh, that needs to be addressed in the criminal justice system. Because I often wonder how do the litigants in my court, how do they trust the system when the people that they're looking at don't look like them at all? And, and how do we change that? So people feel that they can trust, trust the system. So, um, So we've talked a lot about, uh, about women in the judiciary, how we make some changes, and uh, both Allison and Rachel provided a wonderful quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, talking about uh, where we go from here. You know, the, as he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And so obviously that's, uh, that's our goal. And, and how do we, where do we go from here? How do we keep making the changes that we want to make? I think in many ways, that's up to you. Um, <laughs> up to many of the young women in this room who are law students, I think that we can encourage, as Chief Justice Rush um, was saying, you know, we can encourage and do for those who are coming after us, um, young lawyers and law students, what others did for us. But I think it's in continuing to be welcoming and continuing to reach out and encourage young women and people of color who may feel um, less certain about whether their voice is, whether people want to hear their voice, whether they're welcome at the table. So I think that our role is to encourage and your role is to pick up the torch and then to encourage one another. 
Um, and that isn't to say, I mean, certainly there are systemic things that we can do. And Chief Justice Rush mentioned some of the things that Indiana is already doing um, in educating justices on implicit bias and dry Clio and things like that. So I think there are structural administrative things that the profession can do, that courts can do. And I know that bar associations are doing to try to make the profession more hospitable for women and underrepresented minority groups. Um, I think a lot of it is interpersonal too. Like when we think about what each of us can do, um, it can sometimes feel overwhelming to think about how can I plug into all of those other things, you know, which you know we have in the law school available women's legal forum um, and balsa and Tulsa and ways in which um, we can plug in and and help one another. I think if you think about interpersonally, um, that we think of it as the role of each of us to reach out and to encourage and to make everyone feel welcome. Yeah, and we'll continue to make ourselves accessible. Um, I don't think I ever would have called Chief Justice Shepard and asked him boo. Um, <laughs> but really, I, I mean, we want you to succeed and as time allows. I spend time one-on-one -on -one or talking to or if you're thinking about being a judge and you want to know what questions you might be asked in that, or if you're going through, um, you know, I feel obligated. But the other thing is, I don't want to paint the picture that it's all been rosy. It has not all been rosy. I mean, you know, there have been a lot of challenges and setbacks, and, you know, one step forward and back. And um, so, but you, you have to persevere. And, you know, having a law license, graduating in the period of time that you are right now, and what the rule of law means, and what that law license means, and how important it is to have trained lawyers on issues as you're going forth, it's, there's just never been a more important time than what you have. And it's how you use it. You know, you know how you see and question something. Um, you know, when I, you know, I, I have a lot of worries. I mean, I really worry about access to justice. And so if time allows, may it just be a couple hours, but Judge Bacon, who's a judge down in um, Marion County, small claims, just, um, she came and she, she gave me a book called Evicted. Has anyone heard of Evicted, the book? It won a Pulitzer Prize, um, and it really is about the housing crisis that we're looking at right now. So she goes, please come by my court sometime and just watch eviction rates. And I said, well, just pick a day, you know, just I'll pick a day, and I'm going to come, I'll spend a whole morning, and I'll bring a couple of my staff. So I sat there, I'm in small claims, I'm watching 275 eviction cases in the morning. One morning, I mean, people left their home. What's more traumatic than that? Not one of them had a lawyer. South Bend has a lot of evictions, Fort Wayne has a lot of evictions, but Indianapolis is number two in the country for evictions. So I'm thinking about, well, if I could get some like, pro bono attorneys here, um, <laughs> because they had defenses. And I want, you've got the defense, you know these, right? Warranty of habitability, you know the defenses? Have you had any landlords come in? Okay, well, just know that. <laughs> Warranty of habitability, it's a good defense. Um, you know, you know, black mold, I don't have running water, but you know, but you're thinking about the trauma, but this, these are the types of things that you can use your law license. So my, e, e, general counsel for Lily, great. Go spend five minutes, uh, five hours a month um, using your law license to help someone. And then they see you, and then they trust our profession. Like you're gonna represent people pro bono, and you're not gonna remember their names five or 10 years from now, but they are always gonna remember yours. And every time, you may be the one lawyer um, that somebody, what, that people have never met a lawyer before. You're the one lawyer. So you're the sort of the face of the law. So how you set, how you represent the profession, how you hold yourself ethically, and looking at how important character matters in helping somebody um, that's down and out with regard to their rights. 80% of homeless veterans have an unmet civil legal, um, civil legal aid issue that could get them off the street. Over 70% of people living below, below the poverty line have a legal issue that is that an impediment to them, just a life impediment. It might be getting, it might be housing, it might be getting an expungement. But looking at the people we're getting through in the addictions crisis right now, you have a right to an attorney in a criminal case, but you don't have a right to an attorney with regard to an expungement, getting your license back or something else. And you're all going to have that license. So my ask for you is, you know, in looking at the profession, promoting the profession, male or female, you're gonna be that voice. You're gonna be that face and that voice of the profession. People say, use it for good. 
you know, train yourself. Really, you know, you could do two, in one hour, you could figure out um, what the defenses are on, on a house case and go in there and, and, and do that. And you know what? You're going to feel good at the end of the day that you did it. You really are. Um, and we need you to, because I feel, I feel like on a bigger issue that the rule of law is really taking a, a, a whack job right now uh, with regard to people thinking that the judiciary is partisan. Um, and you're going to be sort of that next foot forward on making sure that this, this noble profession that you're going to go in stands true, because that, other than the rule of law, that is the number one thing in our country that makes us different than what's going on in some of the countries that are just in, in, in horrible shape right now. Is that the diversity question you asked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way to go from your question. It was perfect. And Beth, how about you? So I'm gonna you can say anything. I'm going <laughs> to I'm I'm jump right on that because as, as I told you already, access to justice is one of my passions. And um, again, we, we have... Our Chief Justice Rush, um, who has been fabulous in, in the fight for access to justice, and which is, I've been working on this for so many years, and I see so much progress. So thank you for everything that you've done for Indiana. Look at her; she's like yeah. waving me on, but <laughs> um, <laughs> waving you off. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I graduated here, undergrad and law school, uh, Father Hesper lucky to go to commencement with him speaking, and then Father Malloy for law school. And both of them said um, to all of us, you are so lucky to have this education that you have. Um, now your responsibility is to go out and do something good with that. And to have, to, to come to Notre Dame and, and that be the mission to be a different kind of lawyer, um, you are so well suited to, to make progress for any of the things that are out there that we've talked about today that need help. I will tell you that I love my day jobs. I've loved all of my day jobs, but I have found the my most fulfilling parts of my career in volunteering for the causes that, I, that I'm passionate about. That's, that's where I find the real, um, that, that gives me the pep in my step. Those are the things I get excited about, is if I can make progress in some of these issues. And I, I assume that all of you will be the same way. We have these challenges out there, and it takes talented people with a heart to go out there and make change. And so every time you make a small little change, you feel that, um, that success just feels wonderful. And think about if you are helping somebody who doesn't have a lawyer, and uh, how much that means to them that you have given your time um, to help them with a legal problem that is so insurmountable to them and they don't have you know, the money to afford an attorney. So that's what all of you can do. Um, uh, it is a great profession. Um, it's, you can do anything with your education that you receive at this law school, whether it's it is to be a lawyer, whether it is to do some good somewhere else, you've been trained in a different way than um, undergraduates, as you know, have been trained. You have that analytical mind. So you, you have a lot ahead of you that you can do that is great for yourselves and for everyone else. So I think we're getting, we're probably at the end of our time here for our discussion, and I would like to open it up if we can just take a few minutes, maybe answer some questions, but uh, I do want to just share a very quick story before I do, because uh, there's someone here in the audience that I, well, a couple people that I want to recognize, my husband in the front row, who's always been my biggest support, which is why I'm thankfully here in this job now, but also uh, about a year ago, I was sitting at my child's school, and it was a morning assembly for uh, their fourth grade class. And I looked over and I saw a couple friends of mine sitting in that room, and uh, one of whom's here today, my friend Stephanie, who is uh, the South Bend City attorney, and our other friend Kim, who had just gotten a job as a US assistant US attorney. And I got almost weepy at that moment as I looked around and I thought, oh my gosh, doesn't seem like that long ago that I was sitting here in this courtroom 
And here we are, we've, you know, we've got a judge, the city attorney, and uh, an assistant U.S. attorney all in this room of fourth grade parents. <laughs> and, and we're so happy to be here as fourth grade parents too. Uh, but I thought, what an amazing day that, that the three of us are in this room together. And I look around this room and I think, that can be all of you in, a, you know, in just a few years sitting around thinking, oh my gosh, look where we've come from here. And, and I think the thing that makes me the happiest though is to see Miss Elizabeth sitting there with Stephanie, one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, and I think what a bright future we have if she's here and if we can provide uh, examples uh, in our role. Can I give a shout out? Too? Absolutely. I have one of my oldest friends here since we were age five and her mother are here. It's just wonderful to look around and be in this room with my, some of my favorite people. So, and, and be on this panel of amazing women that I feel not worthy to be part of, but I appreciate it anyways. Um, so I think if we just, for a few, could we have a couple minutes for questions? And if anyone has any, and I know there's a great reception going on afterwards. Yes. I would love to say something about this with my professor hat on. <laughs> um, I cannot tell you what you are experiencing is so normal for a first year student. And I can't tell you how many students, when I, when I was full time on the faculty, I taught lots of big classes and I taught civil procedure and constitutional law to first years. And everyone's feeling that way. Moreover, it's very common, and I remember feeling like this when I was in your shoes. You know, there are people who will speak up a lot in class, and you think, oh my gosh, they totally get it, everybody else gets it, and I don't get it. And what the professor can tell you is that often the people who are talking a lot really, that's not an indication of whether they're getting it or not. <laughs> so um, I think what, what I would say to you, just as a self-discipline, is to do not let yourself Think about what other people are doing or not. You are going to constantly hear, and, and I will say that in my experience, this seems to be something that women do to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely saw it with female students more often than male students. Male students, and, and you know, we speak in broad generalities, sometimes there's, you know, some grain of, of truth in a stereotype. Male students just assumed sometimes that they could do it, and female students tended to doubt themselves more. And so I more often had female students in my office expressing these kinds of self-doubts. I would say, put it out of your mind. Believe that, believe what I'm telling you, that everyone in your class is, is feeling the same way that you are. Get the help that you need. Go see your professors just to ask questions, but don't let yourself believe the lie that you can't do it and that everybody else in your class is nailing it. Everybody's struggling and just do at it. I agree. You know, when I applied to be a justice on the um, court, I, uh, I didn't look at anybody else's application. You know, I have no control over, you know, what do I, what do I have control over? I have control over what I'm thinking. And so uh, that's what I do even now. I, you know, I'm going to get myself prepared, but then I'm going to give myself some balance because you've got to do something that you like to do in addition to reading those cases all the time that make no sense your freshman year. Um, <laughs> And then you start, all of a sudden, second year, you start getting in your group. Okay, I did understand how this, how, it, it, it takes anything. It's like survival. Right? I think first year law school is just survival. And don't put, you know, it, <laughs> it is. is. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, like eating coffee grounds. You're eating coffee grounds. <laughs> <laughs> really? um, and I thought everybody was so smart, and the fraud police were going to show up and just <laughs> grab me and say, uh -huh, you actually got your out. Um, so, and I think that's it. I think you have to have some balance. You, you know, set up your day that you're going to do this, and then you're going to do something fun. And you're going to have, you've got to have no study zones. 
do you all have no study zones? Like, I'm not gonna study these, I'm, you know, I'm gonna study this and I don't care if I don't get, I'm, I'm just gonna stop um, and get it at this. We were all back there before in the green room talking about a new podcast called The Happiness, Happiness Lab. And it was, it was about a group of students that really wanted to get into Yale. And so, if, you know, you finally get in, you got into, you got that acceptance letter. How excited were you when you got that acceptance letter to Notre Dame? And then you get there and you go, wow, this isn't so great. I thought it'd be better. Uh, <laughs> so there was a podcast on that. Like, listen, you know, and they, she, she's a professor of psychology at Yale. And so she decided she was going to give her whole class. Do you ever go listen to podcasts? I'm in my car a lot. Um, <laughs> It's good. I mean, she brings these aspects. So find some things where you can divert it, but don't pay attention to anybody else. They're doing their own kind of career. You know, they're doing their own thing. And I was very much overwhelmed. I was very much overwhelmed. And and then second year, you started, okay, I, I'm sort of understanding these cases. And then third year, second year's a hard, are you second years? I feel like they really pile on second year. Are they still doing that? Okay. Um, and then third year, you just kind of get your groove. Uh, so it really is. And the same thing is, I look at, I have between 25 and 30 cases I do every week. I probably have to read half my body length. And I'll, you, know, you get done with the oral argument and cases yesterday, and then I'm looking at a whole other truckload before we had electronic filing we used to bring like a cart and just drop them off at the chambers. And I'll get overwhelmed if I try to tackle all at once. So I break things down into parts too. And that, that has always helped me. You're going to make it. Come extern for me, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you didn't belong here. Right. There was such a rigorous application process, so it it'll it'll click. Just trust all of us; it'll click. <laughs> Anyone else? Any questions? <coughs> yes, in the back. I'm Andrew. I'm a fully undergraduate. <laughs> Well, under diversity jurisdiction, that question would probably go to a federal judge. <laughs> <laughs> and federal judges can't offer advisory opinions. <laughs> what about, what about things that we can't, we can't speak on, like a, a legal issue, like what are your thoughts on? I mean, I, we all have our own private thoughts on that. But we can't speak, we're not publicly on what we think a particular law is, um, is or is not. Well, that's unsatisfactory, but <laughs> it is, it's to my kids at home too. <laughs> Anybody else? There's a question on here. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, what is your advice to for a person, a woman or a person of color, in a meeting where someone like an advocate or an advocate or advocate might be um, in the case in four or seven years? What would you do in that? Um, so I just assert myself. Um, it happens and has so I've been on the Court of Appeals. This is my third term, and the some of the CSOs sometimes think I'm a law clerk. Um, you know, whatever, when you get to be my age, I'm like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, I, I think when that happens, when when in a, sometimes if you're in a room and I think you, if you feel like you are being belittled or overlooked or that sort of thing, my own tactic, I think everybody has to find what works for their personality is I don't tend to get combative. Maybe I feel like on the inside, but I mean, I just handle it by being gracious and then asserting myself or saying, sure, I understand that, but you know, and then shift it to make my point. I think it works best to assume the best because sometimes people don't realize they're doing it. And if people have are acting out of implicit bias, for example, you want 
to, to shake them out of that or, or teach them and, and you'll hit a wall or they'll get up if you, I mean, there's a time and a place, right? It's, it's hard to say in the abstract. Sometimes there's, there's, a, there's a time when you need to speak sharply. But I think in general, in the kinds of situations where I have started to feel a little bit like that, like somebody's talking over me when I'm trying to ask a question at argument or something like that, you just speak louder. You just assert yourself. But personally, what I try to do is to try to be gracious and diffuse the situation and then try to direct it myself. I agree. It still happens to me. I'm, I'll, be at a, I'll be at a bar event. And they'll ask me, who's what, who's wife are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I go, and I go, well, do you have a daughter? You said your daughter was a lawyer. Well, ask her look, to look me up. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I, think, you know, I had a grandmother. I had a grandmother, <laughs> had a grandmother that told me a little sugar goes a long way. And I really think it does. And I always was prepared. I mean, I was a litigator, and so I did jury trials. And you know, people want to push your buttons if you decide that you want to litigate. And that you, you've seen it, if you've been a judge, you've seen somebody push the opposing counsel's buttons and then they mm -hmm. fall apart. Um, and there's some people that, you know, you can keep doing that, but we're just gonna try this case, you know? And I'm, and I'm probably gonna beat you. Um, <laughs> I don't say that, but I'm thinking it, and then I do it. <laughs> um, but it still happens now. I mean, it's still, or it may be an oral argument. There's been studies done that, you know, when women are on the bench and whose questions they ask. I remember Justice Rucker leaned in a couple of times because I asked, we asked questions. You know, that's, that's why we have oral arguments. To, and he goes, answer the chief's question. So, you know, but you just persevere and you be prepared and then you become that force. I will say that it'll make you stronger. Um, overall, you'll learn that um, you're gonna have to figure out, um, as Judge Barrett, Amy, Judge Barrett <laughs> said, um, you have to figure out your own way how to deal with it, but stay positive and um, it'll, having a, Tough skin is, is a good thing. And that's how you, that's the only way you're gonna get it is by having these, these disappointments and figuring out, well, gee, next time, how am I going to handle that? Because you, you, you're you already thinking that there's probably gonna be a next time. I mean, I've been mistaken too as a law clerk just last year, I was introduced and it's like, oh, who, who do you clerk for? And that was really, because I'm much older than you, that was really a compliment. <laughs> but um, so these things happen. Um, and maybe try not to take it personally, which is hard to do. But if, if you can figure out a way not to take it personally, you'll feel better. Um, I hope that helps. No, there's good. Be prepared, because it's going to happen. Um, and, you know, come out. Oh, Notre Dame class of 2021, or you know, on that. But because um, it still happens. I mean, it's you know, I've been a lawyer for almost 40 years, and it still happens. And I just get those voices out of. I just chose to get those voices out of your head. You know, what is driving you, and you stay focused. You stay focused on what's driving you because you're always going to. All of you here, I mean, men and women are going to have different obstacles that are going to be thrown your way. And I think that's how, how, what defines us the most is how we deal with those obstacles. Mm -hmm. So get ready, know that, know that those things are coming and it's not just you, all of you are going to have it. Um, and how are you? I mean, I have people when I was talking court judge, they walk in and like, for, they, if they don't like women and then they have you as a judge, they, it's like, I'm your worst nightmare. And then they, they, they're walking out and you thought, well, you don't have a choice. I mean, they'll <laughs> bring them back in and we're gonna figure out a way that we're gonna get moving on this case because you don't have a choice. All right, well, I think we've surpassed our time and I know Rachel and Allison have some final comments. Uh, I want to say thank you to the three women here on the panel. It's been truly an honor uh, to share this stage with you. Thank you for moderating. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Rachel, I'm with Women's Legal Forum, and I also would like to extend a huge thanks to these incredible panelists, our moderator, Professor Venter, and all of the judges and attorneys who are here in this room. It really is because of women like you that a lot of us are in law school in the first place, and we're so appreciative of your time today. So please join me in thanking them.
And also in the spirit of the fact that we are celebrating 100 years of women's right to vote, at the reception afterwards, we will have voter registration forms. And so <laughs> there's no better way to celebrate it than to exercise it. And so we'll have them on a blue folder at one of the front tables at the reception. And so please sign up if that's um, if you'd like to vote in Indiana or talk to us about how to figure out where you should be registering to vote. Uh, and speaking of the reception, that's where we're all going to head now. Um, you guys can follow the students um, up. It'll be through the Commons and into the library. We also have some banners that we have visiting from the American Bar Association and the Library of Congress that are celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. So you can't miss them because they're on your way to the bar. So, <laughs> um, but thank you again to everyone who came and to our wonderful panelists and we'll see you at the reception. Again, you're, there's two students in the middle. There we go. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs>